the aryans were tribal nomadic people who came and settled in this part of india this is known as the sapta sindhu region sapta means seven and sindhu means rivers and in this area there were seven rivers indus jhelum chenab ravi bias satluj and saraswati so this is where the aryans came and settled 3500 years ago and they also this is the very place that the rigveda was composed now we are going to learn more about it so we know that the aryans came to india and settled in the sapta sindhu region however do we know where did they come from well they came from the central asia region and spread to different parts of the world now an interesting thing happened well when they spread to different places their language also spread with them and so here's a fun fact don't you think that the sanskrit word matra is very much similar to the english word mother latin mater french mere and german mother well don't you think it's too big of a coincidence well the historians also think that the aryans spread from one common place and distributed variants of their language to different parts of asia and africa and this is the common link between all of these languages isn't that interesting so today we have our school books and textbooks but what about the children 3000 years ago well they also had something very similar to it they had the vedas which is sanskrit for wisdom or knowledge this comes to us from the word vid which means to know so the vedas are the source of ancient indian knowledge that came along with the aryans right so this with this the vedic period in india began this was from 1500 bc to 600 bc and this is the vedic period which is divided into two halves about which we will learn in a while so how were these vedas composed well you see the aryan sages or rishis while meditating tried to find religion or tried to find god in their surrounding and then they received divine messages and once composed they passed it down from one generation to the next how exactly did they pass this down well they heard it memorized it and then passed it down to their pupils who also listened or heard to these and then passed it down to their pupils this is how the vedas were transmitted from one generation to the next this comes under shruti literature shruti means that which is heard and the vedas come under shruti literature amongst them the rig veda was composed the earliest it was composed during the early vedic period and its impact is so much that this entire time period is also known as rig vedic period then during the later vedic period the other three vedas were composed the sama veda yajur veda and atharva veda so the early vedic period or the rig vedic period was from 1500 bce to 1000 bce and the later vedic period was from 1000 bce to 600 bce in which the later three vedas were composed now let's listen to the gayatri mantra om bhur bhuvasva Didn't that soothe you? Well, you'd be surprised to know that the Gayatri mantra also comes to us from the Rig Veda. So just imagine how many people must have heard and recited the very same Gayatri mantra. So now, Rig Veda literally means in praise of knowledge. Other than that, it is the oldest Veda. Well, it was composed during the early Vedic period and. 
so it came first before the other three vedas hence it becomes the oldest veda and it was composed about 3500 years ago the hymns that are present in the rig veda are in the form of dialogues so take a look at this box here it has a conversation between vishwamitra and the rivers vishwamitra was a very famous sage from that time so here you might want to pause the video and read the conversation the rig veda includes more than a thousand hymns which are called sukta or well said which are praising gods and goddesses and it is composed in sanskrit but this sanskrit is very different from the sanskrit that you and me can read in schools today in fact this was vedic sanskrit lastly the rigveda also acts as a source of information for the historians today so it is only because of this rigveda that we get to know how the aryans lived during the early vedic age so the historians find this very interesting now let's learn what we can find in the rigveda firstly it also tells about the gods and goddesses of that age right so let's take a look at this god here this is indra the warrior god who was worshiped by the people during the early vedic age so why was indra worshiped will you see wars and battles were a very common thing back then right and so any aryan would want that the god of war indra would be in favor of them so that they win all the battles right this is why indra was so important to them next we have agni who was the god of fire so you see science wasn't developed back then right so these people did not really understand how fire emerged and so they were scared of it soon they visualized this god and then it turned to agni who was the god of fire fire was very important to these people and so they worshiped him other than that there was also another god who was soma the god of sacrifices and he was associated with the moon apart from that soma is also the name of an intoxicating drink which is said to be drunk by gods and their priests during rituals and sacrifices along with that it also acted as an elixir whose consumption healed many illnesses and also brought in wealth so this is why this god was also so important in fact the rigveda praises and acknowledges soma and it is also said that indra was fond of it too along with that there are many prayers in the rigveda for cattle children and horses well you see cows acted as a symbol of strength back then it acted as a currency and the richest man in town would be the man with the most number of cows hence it is obvious that the people would pray for more cattle right other than that the birth of a male child was also preferred however it is important to note that women had rights and they weren't mistreated in the early vedic age still maybe because these male child could grow up and hold positions of powers maybe that is why male child were preferred right do you think this tradition still goes on in india well sadly it does in several backward parts of this country the birth of a male child is preferred and girls are seen as a burden hopefully in the future this thinking will change apart from that there were also several prayers in the rigveda for horses so let's find out why horses were important to these people you see horses were important to these people because horses were attached to such chariots right so why were these chariots important well these chariots were used for battle so why were battles exactly fought let's find out well you see battles were fought for cattle so once again you can understand how important cattle was during this early vedic age right 
Apart from that, they were also fought for land, which was important for pasture and also for growing hardy crops, which would grow easily, such as barley, right? Other than that, some battles were also fought for water and to capture people. So now, can you answer this question? Dash were attached to chariots and used for battles. Cats, elephants, donkeys or horses? Well, the correct answer is horses. Now, such battles were being fought, right? So, we can understand that wealth was coming in. So now, wealth that was obtained was kept by the leaders and some of it was given to the priest and the rest was distributed amongst the people. So from that, we can understand that during the Rig Vedic period or the early Vedic period, the people held more importance, right? In fact, the king would often hold feasts which would lead to the wealth that was obtained by him to go back to the people and hence maintain a peaceful balance in the society. Other than that, wealth was also used for performance of yajnas or sacrifices, right? And in these yajnas or sacrifices, offerings were made to please gods and goddesses. Offerings were made to fire and these would sometimes include ghee, grains, and in some cases, animals. So we can understand that during the early Vedic age, such offerings were being made to please gods. So now, let's discuss about this Raja. So we can understand that during the early Vedic period, the Rajas did not hold as much power as the people. In fact, the people elected the Raja, right? And so we can understand that the sons of these Rajas did not succeed their fathers, right? So the people elected the Rajas during that time. These people were called Jana or Bish. Jana meaning tribe and some of the most famous Jana or Bish that we know about are the Bharata Jana, the Puru Jana and the Yadu Jana. Right? And it is from this Bharata Jana that India gets its name Bharat. Lastly, these Jana or Vish even had their own assemblies for discussing important topics of war and peace. These assemblies were known as Sabha and Samiti. So these Rajas that we see here were elected by the people. Why were they elected by the people? Well, because they were strong and brave. Right? However, Unlike the other Rajas that you might have heard about, these Rajas did not have capital cities, nor did they have palaces, neither did they collect taxes. So they were very different than the Rajas that we have heard about. So these people who had composed the hymns of the Rig Veda called themselves Aryas. However, when they first came to the Sapta Sindhu region, they saw that people were already residing here, right? These people were dark-skinned. And they were different from them in the sense that they did not hold sacrifices or rituals and they spoke a completely different language, right? They termed them as their opponents and named them Dasas or Dasyus. And later on, a female or a feminine version of this name also came, which was Dasi. And all of it together came to be meaning slaves, right? So these Aryans were fair-skinned who had come from outside, they were fair-skinned, whereas the Dasas or the Dasyus that were already living in the Sapta Sindhu region were dark-skinned. So now, a new system emerged from all of this. This new system was the Varna system, in which the people's skin color really mattered a lot. And it was based on their function in the society. So one could easily change their varna by changing their position or their function in the society. So now let's learn more about this varna system. You see, the varna system had four divisions and the people on top had more power. So the people on, on top included the Brahmans who were priests or teachers, right? So they were closer to God and hence they held more power. 
below them were the kshatriyas these were the kings rulers or soldiers who were protecting the people and so they also held an important position in the society below them came the vaishyas and these were the commoners this is where the vish term comes from right so these were the common people of the society now below them were the shudras who were sometimes war criminals and acted as slaves for the upper three classes they were men and women and they basically had no rights of their own so this is the varna system now you see during the early vedic age what had happened is that this varna system was lenient and flexible in fact one could easily change their varna by simply changing their position or occupation right but now in the later vedic age this varna system became rigid and oppressive and one could no longer change their varna as it had become hereditary so far we have seen that the rajas were well liked by the people and elected by the people right however a change came into the society around 3000 years ago there was a change in the society what happened well now the rajas were much more stronger and powerful and the people did not hold as much power as they did before the system of becoming a raja became hereditary and so the people no longer elected who the rajas were going to be in fact some men now were recognized as rajas by performing very big sacrifices such as the ashwamedha yajna so you see now these complex rituals and sacrifices held an important position in the society because the kings now had to prove to the people that they were worthy of becoming their king so now let's learn about the ashwamedha yajna so in the ashwamedha yajna it involved a white horse and the king this white horse was let loose and he would then wander around in enemy territories so if the enemy king would allow the raja's horse to pass then that king would have accepted the raja who was conducting the sacrifice however if the horse was stopped by a, another king then it would lead to a battle now let's see what happens after this battle these rajas were then invited to a yajna which was done by a specially trained priest in fact he would also sprinkle holy water on the king the king held the main position and whereas the other people or the other rajas were simply spectators the king during this yajna held the most powerful position and he was considered the most powerful person the king holding the sacrifice would be considered the strongest and he would also have a special seat or a tiger skin throne other than that the king's wife sons and other relatives would also have to perform minor rituals the vaishyas and other common people would also come bearing gifts for the king however the shudras were not invited so at the end of the ceremony the horse was sacrificed so thanks to the rig veda now we know that the rajas during that point of time were conducting such complex rituals don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon you can also register for free on deltastep.com or download the delta step app and get easy access to more than 5000 amazing videos as per your school syllabus master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and get a chance to win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now